Joy to the world. Oh, that's a blessing, isn't it? God has given to us so much for us to all be thankful for, and uh, it is a blessing that we can come and, and celebrate what Jesus Christ has, has accomplished for us. Well, we want to welcome you this morning. Thank you, choir. Thank you, music teams, for all the uh, hard work throughout the Christmas season and uh, bringing us to this point. Well, they say that we're on the cusp of Christmas. Uh, someone said this is Christmas Eve. Is that right? Uh, all right, so um, that means we have Christmas Eve services here tonight, not to bring an advertisement your way, but let me just encourage you. Uh, how many have not started Christmas shopping at all yet? Uh, one, good, all right, good for you. Um, I, I like that spirit, wait till the last minute and uh, just throw your hands up in the air, works every time. Well, Christmas is an interesting holiday. In fact, all of our holidays, uh, if you stop and you think about it, they've, they've all... Uh, uh, kind of morphed into something uh, quite a bit different than probably what they were originally intended to be. Christmas is interesting because on the one hand, we're celebrating the birth of our Savior, Jesus Christ, and we're all in for that, aren't we? And at the same time, the world is celebrating an entire different track called Christmas as well. But it's not the only, uh, truly only ho holiday that's like that. When you think of Thanksgiving, Thanksgiving goes back to the pilgrims, doesn't it? It goes back to the pilgrims, and yet we've forgotten about the pilgrims. It's really about football and getting ready to shop for Christmas. Uh, it's amazing how things have changed. We even think of Easter, and we think of what it means to celebrate the resurrection of Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord, and we think of how powerful that dynamic truly is. And at the same time, we're hijacked into thinking that, well, it's all about chocolate candy and, and rabbits and eggs. And uh, we, we've taken uh, these central themes and they've morphed into something quite a bit different. Well, this morning I want to bring to your attention the reality of Christmas. Uh, the reality of Christmas is something that I believe we should take a moment uh, and just be able to, to share in this. I'm reminded that I'm looking back through, this is my grandmother's Bible, uh, one of two that I, actually three that I have from her. Uh, this is a very, very old Bible. In fact, she received this Bible before she became a Christian. And so uh, it, it's fascinating for me to be able to look through it. And I'd like to read a few verses here uh, from a couple of different passages. Uh, and this is the old King James. And I mean, there's King James and then there's old King James. This is an old King James. But would you take your Bibles if you want to follow along and turn with uh, me to Matthew chapter 1. And let's all stand as we read God's Word this morning. And if you'd like just to follow along, that is fine as well. Matthew chapter 1 and verse 21 says, And she shall bring forth a son, and thou shalt call his name Jesus, for he shall save his people from their sins. Now all this was done that it might be fulfilled which was spoken of the Lord by the prophet, saying, Behold, a virgin shall be with child, and shall bring forth a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which being interpreted is God with us. And then look at Luke chapter 2 with me. Luke chapter 2, a very well-known passage of Scripture. Again, going back to this in the King's English. In chapter 2 and verse 1, it came to pass in those days that there went out a decree from Caesar Augustus that all the world should be taxed. And this taxing was first made when Cyrenius was governor of Syria. And all went to be taxed, every one into his own city. And Joseph also went up from Galilee out of the city of Nazareth into Judea, unto the city of David, which is called Bethlehem, because he was of the house and lineage of David, to be taxed with Mary, his espoused wife, being great with child. And so it was that while they were there, the days were accomplished that she should be delivered. And she brought forth her firstborn son and wrapped him in swaddling clothes and laid him in a manger because there was no room for them in the inn. And there were in the same country shepherds abiding in their field, keeping watch over their flock by night. And lo, the angel of the Lord came upon them and the glory of the Lord shone round about them. And they were sore afraid. And the angel said unto them, Fear not, for behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy, which shall be to all people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, which is Christ the Lord. And this shall be a sign unto you. You shall find the babe wrapped in swaddling clothes, lying in a manger. 
And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of the heavenly host, praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace, goodwill toward men. Well, there is much within all of these verses to encourage our hearts this morning, and I pray that that will be the outcome of this morning's message. Let's look to the Lord in prayer, shall we? God, we are so very thankful for the great news of the coming of Jesus Christ. Father, we think of the coming and we think of what was accomplished through Jesus' visit here on earth. We thank you and praise you, Father, that there is a Savior who has come, a Savior who has died, paid the penalty for our sin, that we might have the opportunity to have a right relationship with our Creator. May you bless the Word of God to us this morning, Lord, as we explore the reality of Christmas. And may it truly be a blessing to our hearts today. In Jesus' wonderful name, amen. You may be seated, please. Well, in Luke chapter 2, as I mentioned, we come to certain realities of Christmas. And there's, as you know, many challenges uh, that are out there with regard to uh, the actuality of Christmas. I was looking for an illustration, and I was looking through various clips from sitcoms, and I came across an old sitcom uh, that uh, was interesting because the main character of the sitcom was talking about uh, Christ and, and him being a Christian. And uh, he didn't have his theology correct at all, and he looked over at someone in his family who was seated, seated uh, across from him, and that person said to him, look, he says, we have absolutely no proof that Jesus was the Son of God. We only ha know that he lived, that he walked, and that he was a great prophet and storyteller. And I thought uh, as they went back, it just went from the sublime to the ridiculous as they dialogued back and forth. But I thought to myself, oh, he is so wrong. Because the reality of Christmas is that Jesus Christ is himself God come in the flesh. Now looking here at Luke and looking at Luke chapter 2, I want to point out a few realities for us to consider. Some things that we can maybe put in the back of our mind and walk from here today uh, remembering throughout the rest of the Christmas season. There are many realities. Uh, one of the realities, as you know, when it comes to the birth of Jesus Christ is that the birth uh, occurs on a real day. In fact, the Bible tells us in Galatians chapter 4, when the fullness of time had come, God sent forth his son, born of a woman, born under the law. This was a day that God had set aside. This was not just an arbitrary date. This was something that was planned from before the foundation of the earth. God had determined that man was going to need a savior. And as I read for you the passage uh, in the Old Testament last week, as we were looking at uh, Isaiah, we looked and we saw that God realizes that man is without a redeemer. Man is without a hope. And so on this particular day, a very special day, we find that the fullness of time had finally arrived and Jesus Christ himself, God, would come to this earth. That's the reason we're celebrating. This is a very, very real day. And again, I point out the fact that, and I don't know why, some, some years I get going on a particular topic, but I've really been trying to figure out why they celebrate uh, or why we celebrate Christmas on December 25th. Uh, I'm all for it. I loved it as a kid because some years my birthday would be October 25th and Thanksgiving would be November 25th and Christmas would be December 25th. It was like the trifecta of trifectas. I mean, I was all excited about that. But why is it that December 25th? And I look back and in the early church, there was very little emphasis on the birth date of Jesus Christ. In fact, the early church really was riveted on the date of the crucifixion, and they were really all about looking at the resurrection and trying to figure out that. And so all of your early writings and all of the early thought processes were all geared towards Easter, as we would call it, or Resurrection Sunday, better understood. It was all about what Jesus Christ had done. And so the celebration began, and the celebration continued, but it was about the accomplishment of the crucifixion. And Jesus Christ paying for our sin. 
very little thought was actually given to the birthday of Jesus. They figured out, some early church theologians, that the best time to understand the actual date for the crucifixion and resurrection was right around March 25th. And someone got in their heart and mind that the same date of the crucifixion would actually be the same date as the conception of Jesus. And so because of that, they thought to themselves, all right, he was conceived on March 25th. That means nine months later, it is December 25th. Well, that's interesting, and in the early church, they started to celebrate that in the early centuries, and by the time uh, things began to, to rivet out of there, you had January 6th is also a date when they would celebrate. In fact, the Armenian church was a very strong group of believers there. The Armenian church, uh, and even modern Armenia, still celebrate uh, January the 6th as the birth of Jesus Christ. In fact, if you stop and think about it, if you're good at math, you can do the math between December 25th and January 6th when this other group celebrated it, and guess how many days that is? 12 days. Hence the song, The 12 Days of Christmas. As I got thinking about all of this, it really didn't matter to me. What matters the most is that God had a plan and he sent Jesus here to die for me, to redeem me as part of fallen mankind. There is no question, not only is it a real time, but there is a real place. Notice with me here in Luke chapter 2. Uh, that uh, Luke is very specific as to what is happening here. Everyone went on his way, verse 3, to register. And Joseph has to go up from Galilee to the city of Nazareth, to Judea, to the city of David, which is called Bethlehem. And as you may know, Micah chapter 5 and verse 2 is going to prophesy uh, that indeed uh, Bethlehem, Ephrathah, your the one place that Jesus is going to be born. And so, born this day, born in this place, we see the reality of Christmas taking place. Now, it's fascinating that when the Bible talks about um, giving birth in verse 7, she wrapped him in uh, in those clothes, the King James says in the swaddling clothes, and laid him in a manger because there was no room for them in the inn. Now, it's a very real place. And most of the Christmas plays that you have uh, where they're trying to reenact the whole scene, there's usually an innkeeper, and he's usually pretty funny, isn't he? I mean, he's a little kid, and he's breaking his heart because he's got to turn away Mary and Joseph. But in reality, do you know in the scriptures, there's never an indication that there was an innkeeper. In fact, the word uh, in the Greek for this inn was actually the same word that Jesus used when he talked about the upper room where the disciples all uh, gathered uh, before the crucifixion for the Last Supper. And so it was a, a room, it was a place. There was no room for them in the room, if you were. In fact, as Joseph would go to Bethlehem, it's very likely that he would go to a place where his ancestors lived, and he would go to that family's place. It's most likely that the family was there, and there wasn't really any room for him and for his wife. And don't, re- don't forget the reality is that a woman who was that great with child would not be traveling alone. There was probably a whole entourage with Joseph and Mary because they're anticipating this great birth that she is going to have. And so uh, there's probably a whole group of them. And it's no doubt that there's not room for them to all go into an upper room in Joseph's family's home. And so the only place for this entourage would actually be in the lower levels of the home. This is the lower level where the animals would go because they would be out of the cold, but more importantly, they wouldn't be stolen from uh, the owners. And so oftentimes underneath the homes there were places, and yes, there were uh, in that area a trough that Jesus would be laid in, laid in that manger. And so all of that very, very accurate. This is a very real time and a very real place. When we come to the announcement that's made, we see that there is also a really miraculous event that takes place here. And and we see it because as the angels are going to uh, indicate, uh, Jesus is born. And Jesus is not uh, just uh, someone who's an average baby. But the Bible tells us that in verse 11, 
when the angel declares, he says, for today in the city of David, there has been born for you a savior who is Christ the Lord. Now, I just want to break down those little terms that are there in verse 11. Obviously, the angel comes. This is pretty significant. The angel makes this announcement, and we have uh, recorded there that there is a Savior. Now, three things that are really important here, three things that really do stand out. One is that there is a Savior. Number two, it is the Christ. And number three, uh, He is the Lord. And so all three of those dynamics are incredibly important. First of all, there's a Savior. Matthew, we just got through reading chapter 1, talks about Jesus and mentioning his name and the fact that he will save his people from what? Their sins. Jesus Christ comes to be the Savior of the world, to save mankind from his sins. One of the problems today is the same problem that there's always been. Not everyone wants to be saved from their sins. The problem with us is we have a great appetite for sin, and we love to hold on to sin. We love to be able to to enjoy the, the ramifications of that sin. Jesus Christ has come to save us from our sins. And when we think of the significance of our sins, we have to understand that our sins have separated us from God. And our sins have caused for us to look at perishing, For all eternity, being separated from God because of them. You and I have a tremendous need, and the need is to have salvation. We need to be saved from the consequences of our sins, and there is absolutely no way that you and I can save ourselves. There's nothing that we can do. There's nothing good enough that we can muster in order to be able to appeal to our holy God and creator. And so we stand there with this great need. This need is so profound, is it not? And yet Jesus would come, and he would come with the very specific desire, and that is to save us. And so he is called upon, and he is listed here as our Savior. Well, being Savior is just amazing. He is not only the Savior, but he is the one who was prophesied. And so we come to the second aspect of this, which said he he is Christ. Uh, The word Christ there means anointed one. He is the one that's been prophesied about. He is the one who is the Messiah. This is the one who has come. He has been long predicted. He has been, for some at least, truly, truly been the hope. And they've been longing for him for quite some time. He is that long-awaited Savior. This is the Christ. And so as this baby is born, I wonder as we look at the pictures and we see the, the pictures even in the, in the slide here, we see a baby, but Jesus is not just a baby. He is Savior. He is Christ. And then third, the angel would proclaim, he is Lord. He is Lord. Think of the implications with me for just a moment when you stop and you think about the fact that he is Lord. It's been prophesied that uh, he would be the ruler, the sovereign one, the mighty God, the wonderful, the mighty counselor, the everlasting father, the prince of peace. All of these terms, all of these names given to him. You see, this little baby who's so humble there in the manger is Lord of the universe. He is, yes, the Savior, and yes, he is the anointed one from God. But make no mistake about it. He is God himself come in the flesh. And because he is God himself, he is entitled to ruling and reigning throughout this universe. Amen? There is no question that this all belongs to him. That the rightful place on the throne is his. And he alone. For unto us is born, unto us a son is given, the government shall be upon his shoulder His name shall be called Wonderful, Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father. Do you hear that? Jesus' name, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Of the increase of his government and of peace, there will be no end. Well, that's pretty significant, isn't it? 
So we have a, a real time and we have a real place and we have a really miraculous event. God himself has come. But then I want you also to see that there is really, when we stop and consider Christmas, a great, great blessing. I mean, there is a tremendous blessing. And this is part of the angel's announcement as well. For the announcement will come. Notice with me here in Luke chapter 2, where he says, as these shepherds are out there in the fields, the angel of the Lord stands before them. The glory of the Lord shines round about them. The angel said, do not be afraid. I'm going to bring you good news of great joy. And again, he says, for today in the city of David, there's been born for you a Savior who is Christ the Lord. Verse 12 This will be a sign. You'll find the baby wrapped in clothes and lying in a manger. Notice verse 13. Verse 13 tells us that all of a sudden the gears shifted. I mean, this is pretty exciting when the gears shift, right? You know what I mean. I mean, it's almost like when you, when you, I don't know if you drive a clutch, but when you, when you downshift, when you downshift with a clutch, all of a sudden the RPMs and the motor come up. You know what I mean? Boom! And, and you get a burst of power and, and it just ramps it up into another level. It's almost like a great orchestra when, when they get to that place in the, in the, uh, in the music where, where they're supposed to crescendo and it's supposed to get much louder and all of a sudden they go from something soft to something much greater this is the message of verse 13 this is the most important part because these angels are not there just announcing to these shepherds the reality of and i say not just but to say that he is and announcing him as savior and christ and the lord but this is what happens suddenly the bible says there appeared Now, this is something that happens. It's almost like, boom, wow, what happened? Uh, Here it was. It was just just a normal angel. There you are as a shepherd, and, you know, you're just out there minding your sheep. You're just, you know, that's just a boring night. You're looking for shooting stars, and, you know, maybe you're singing your favorite song, and, you know, uh, it's just one of those average nights. All of a sudden, the angel of the Lord appears, and if that's not enough, verse 13 says, and suddenly something else happens. And this sudden event is something of great significance. Notice here verse 13 where it tells us here, He goes on, he says, suddenly there appeared with the angel that's making the announcement a multitude of the heavenly host, praising God and having something very important to say. I'm guessing that if an angel all of a sudden appeared to us here, we would say to ourselves, well, that was quite a service. You know, I'm glad, glad I got up and went to church this morning. I mean, there was an angel. I mean, it was amazing, you know, two big boys, you know, telling us all this stuff. And then all of a sudden, something really radical happened. This whole army of angels appeared, and this whole army of angels had this enormous, enormous announcement to make. This is what they said, and you don't want to miss this because... Something of this magnitude, you know, carries with it an enormous weight of significance. Verse 13, 14 says, glory to God was their announcement. Glory to God in the highest and on earth, peace among men with whom he is well pleased. There's two things there in verse 14 I want you to see. Number one, it's all about God's glory. It's all about God's glory. Glory to God in the highest. God is glorified because this child is born. He has come in the flesh. This incarnation has taken place. Jesus, who is God, has come to redeem fallen mankind. It has all been part of God's divine sovereign plan. It is all coming together now, and God is to be praised. God is to be exalted because there was man condemned in his sin all have sinned and come short of the glory of God, and God now has come to redeem man from that fallen condition, lift him up out of his sinful way, and give to him new life through Christ. 
There is reason, my friends, to give glory to God. And the angel, not by himself, but now accompanied by an entire army of angels, are all singing out glory to God in the highest. I'm telling you what, if that one angel didn't get the hairs on the back of the necks of those shepherds to stand up, that whole army of angels certainly did. You want to get excited about the reality of Christmas? There is a lot to be excited about with regard to the reality of Christmas. Glory to God in the highest. But we're not ending it there. Because the angels, in their multitude, are going to connect something of very great importance. They're going to make a connection between the glory to God and the peace that we have here on earth. And it's important to note how this piece rolls out for us. Now, the King James Version, a version you might have grown up with, I, I grew up with it. It says, and on peace, on earth, peace, what's the next part of it? Good will toward man. And unfortunately, that's not a great, accurate translation. The New American Standard here says, and on earth, peace among men with whom he is pleased. Uh, ESV, another popular version that's been gaining a lot of traction, says similarly, and on earth peace among those with whom he is pleased. The point is this, even though God offers peace and the opportunity for peace goes out to a world that is separated from a holy God, only those who come and receive the gift of eternal life, receive that free gift, will have this peace that the Bible describes. The entire world, as I would understand it, has the opportunity to have a relationship with God through Christ. And they can know this peace that is being proclaimed by this multitude of angels. But those who refuse the Lord Jesus Christ will not have this peace. Now you look around the world today and it's easy, isn't it? And every December it seems like it's the same thing. There are so many things that happen that just go to highlight for us the reality uh, that the world is not at peace. Uh, there are tensions, there are problems, and it, and it starts on the highest level, doesn't it? It starts on the highest level. Uh, it starts between countries and governments. There's certainly all kinds of tensions in the world. Uh, maybe that's why uh, so many uh, people around the world like to shrink back into the Christmas songs and listen to the Christmas music. And I'm not talking about the, uh, the, the Christian uh, carols, but rather the, the secular Christmas music because it makes it out that the world's a wonderful place. Uh, and maybe just for a little bit they can relax from it. But the truth of the matter is the world is not at peace. And there are many people who do not have peace in their own hearts. And because of that, it flows from them. And their relationships are without peace as well. The angels proclaim glory to God in the highest. And on earth, peace among men with whom he is pleased. Now, let me just offer to you three points here. And let's think about this for just a moment with the backdrop of the definition of peace. If we're to define peace, peace could be said to be the absence of conflict and animosity. But it's also the presence of joyful tranquility. So peace is something that all of us should really desire. Would you agree with that? All of us should be desiring that. But if we want to truly have peace, it needs to begin with our relationship with God. That's where this peace is going to come from. First place that we have to look is peace with God. And that's what's coming from verse uh, 14. On earth, peace among, the, among men with whom he is pleased. Now, the only way that you and I can please God is if our sins are paid for by the blood of Christ. And the only way that can happen is if, is if you have reached out and received by faith the work of Jesus Christ. God isn't going to force himself on anyone. God didn't do that starting all the way back with Adam and Eve, did he? If God wanted to force 
mankind to do something, he could have put up an enormous electrical fence around that one tree in the midst of the garden. But he didn't do that. He said, here you go, you're going to make a choice. I've told you the consequences. You're going to have to make the choice. You're here this morning, and if you want to be pleasing to God, you can't be pleasing to God still dead spiritually in your trespasses and sins. There needs to be a, an event that takes place in your life whereby old things pass away and all things become new. There needs to be that transformation. We can call it salvation. We can call it regeneration. We can call it a lot of different things. But the reality is it means coming to Christ and acknowledging that he is God, that he has died on the cross for you. He's died on the cross for me, and he has taken upon himself my personal sin and the consequences of that sin. And so he takes the sin out of my life that I am responsible for, and instead he deposits into my life righteousness. And only Jesus Christ can deposit that righteousness for us because he is the only one who's ever lived who is truly righteous. And no surprise there, it is God who is holy, so it makes perfect sense. I need to have as a number one priority relationship in my life, a relationship of peace with my creator. And God has made this possible through Jesus Christ. We can have that opportunity. And that is the most important message of Christmas. Do you have that relationship with him, peace with God? And second of all, I believe it's important to note that we can have peace with ourselves. Peace with ourselves. There are so many people in the world today who don't know peace. They don't have peace in their life. There's anxieties, there's fears, there's torments of all sorts, there's discouragements. Paul talks about this in Philippians when he says that God, the peace of God that passes all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. And that is a very true and very strong reality. You want to have peace? First of all, have peace with God the Father, and you will see that that peace flows into your life. And how we live our life as followers of Jesus Christ is vastly different than how the rest of the world lives their life. The rest of the world, the, the, they don't have peace. But it doesn't just stop there. It also affects our relationship with others. And we can have peace with others as well. You see, God has accomplished a great deal. This is the reality of Christmas. This is the reality because this is the Christmas message. This is the declaration from that army of angels. Glory to God in the highest and peace among men with whom God is well pleased. Points to consider. Do you have peace with God today? We celebrate Christmas. We celebrate the reality of it. But let me ask you that question because only you and the Lord know the answer, quite frankly. We can look, we can make ourselves to, to look absolutely righteous on the outside because righteousness to a degree can be copied, can it? We, we, we know what people tend to think and so we try to march within the lines. But let me ask you this question. Is your heart truly at peace with God? As God looks into your heart and life, this is the main question. Because the main question really isn't, well, do you have a peace relationship? With? The most important thing is, as God looks at your life, what does he see? Is he well pleased? The Bible says, not by works of righteousness, which we have done, but it's according to his mercy that he saved us. You and I can't please God, is the point, by doing good works. We can try. You can try it. Many people have tried it, but the Bible tells us that every person who's tried it has failed because there is none righteous, no, not one. Do you have a peace relationship with God because he looks at you and realizes that you've been made alive in Christ Jesus? I trust that this Christmas will be a very peaceful Christmas for you. That you will be able to look at your life and say, 
regardless of the circumstances of your life, I know I am at peace with God and God is at peace with me. And throughout all the tumults of life, you're able to say, I have the peace of God that I can't even understand how it's there. It passes all understanding, guarding my heart and mind in Christ Jesus. And so I have peace with my God. My God has peace with me, and I have peace in my heart. And as much as possible, Paul would point out, live peaceably with all men. I have peace with others. What a glorious, glorious coming. We stop and we think about the reality of Christmas. There's a lot to be excited about, isn't there? Because without Christmas, you and I would not know peace. We would be miserable, still dead in our sins. Do you have peace this Christmas? Let's pray. Let's just take a moment and bow our hearts before the Lord today. Let's take a moment to examine our heart and just ask ourselves that important question. Do I really have peace? Do I know that peace? Is it real? Does God have peace with you today? Remember, God doesn't say he wants you to be religious. He doesn't say he wants you to do more of something. What God looks for in your life is whether or not you have a relationship with him through Jesus Christ. Your sins have been forgiven. You're here this morning and you're not sure about whether or not you have a peace relationship with God. That is, God has a peace relationship with you. And you say to me, Pastor Kevin, remember me in prayer. God's pulling at my heart today. I want to be able to say that I have that type of relationship with my creator, but I'm not sure. Is there anyone who just slip up your hand, just be honest and say, Pastor Kevin, pray for me. God's doing a work in my heart. I want to have that peace relationship with Christ. Is there anyone I can pray for you today? Thank you. Father in heaven, we thank you. We praise you. For there is none like you. And God, we just thank you for making a way for us to be redeemed. Redeemed from the consequences of our sin, rescued from hell, and made new in the relationship with our God through Jesus Christ. Bless those who've asked for prayer this morning, Lord, I pray. I thank you for the Spirit of the Lord who works in all of our hearts, and I pray that you would complete the work that you've begun. May you be glorified, Lord, in all things, I pray, in Christ's precious and holy name, amen. Christmas Eve service. I don't expect you to come for both of them, <laughs> but you certainly are welcome. <laughs> May God bless you. Merry Christmas.